Uh, why don't we start, uh, I like the question that Akila asked to get it started, but just before that, Innovation Expedition Global Network. What is that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, nice and close to the mics, everybody. It's a management consulting company. So oh, nothing, right. nothing, nothing that fancy. It's a management. It's got a fancy yeah. name, but it's a management consulting yeah. company. <laughs> okay, Michael Fullen, get us started here. I, I think that's a good place to start. The specific skills that we need that are unique and necessary for students in the 21st century. They are what? Well, first they have to, in, in our work, they have to be uh, present in practice. That is, that is, you have to go right and start doing it. It, the main reason is kids are incredibly bored in school, so there's an opening. Uh, and uh, and on, on my website, we did we have three videos. Uh, I'll get to your question in a second, but three videos, 10 minutes each. You, you can download them on our YouTube channel. Uh, they're Ontario schools. They're schools that were really boring three years ago, and they're dynamite three years later. And this so this stuff works, it works fast. Uh, the the skills, sometimes we call uh, talk about the six Cs. You'll see them in those, some of those videos. Uh, the traditional ones that uh, traditional tw I'm going to say 21st century because they've been around for 25 years but nobody's been implementing them so the critical thinking communication creativity collaboration and then um, citizenship and character e education which uh, character education being the drive and the entrepreneurial work and the persistence the resilience so these are things that not only are the skills but the pedagogy to get there is happening you have to link the two obviously a lot to unpack there, which we'll do, but let's hear from everybody on this first. Jamil, you want to add anything to that list? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll add in terms of thinking about skills that there are um, what, I guess, in economics we could call non-cognitive skills uh, that I think are really important too. Persistence, resilience, um, comfort with failure, uh, the, abi the, yeah, the ability to um, 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 be resilient through challenges, um, grit, character. There's a great Canadian by the name of Paul Tuff uh, who writes a lot about these issues in the United States. And uh, I think that you know, Canadian context would benefit a lot from kind of picking up on some of that terminology. So the only thing I would add to what was, I think, a great list of the skills we want to be thinking about. Do you think the school system can teach those things? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of examples of um, helping, uh, you know, things like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, the um, discipline, uh, self-control, the ability to um, uh, assess uh, character growth and development. There's a lot of tools emerging um, uh, largely through uh, innovative um, programs uh, through the charter school system in the U.S. Uh, that are rooted in um, neighborhoods that um, are afflicted by poverty. And so I think there's a lot of ways that those things can be, if not taught at the very least, um, measured and encouraged um, to grow um, throughout one's public education experience. Terry, what's on your list? Um, I, I think my, my colleagues have hit the big ones, but the, um, there's a few things that have come up through some of our research. So um, entrepreneurial spirit and effective risk management. So what we learned through some of the productivity research we did, we're a very risk averse culture in some aspects. We need, we need our students growing up to understand effective and smart risk management so they can take on risks and drive things forward. Um, couldn't agree more with creativity and um, and the entrepreneurial spirit. So how do we create uh, people that are willing to take on and, and create new companies and, and drive things forward? Um, the aspects around morals and ethics and values, I think, is a very important one. We were chatting at the break around some of the technologies we talked about and the fact that just because we can do something with robotics, for example, and, and replace human jobs, should we? Should we do that? And, and so I think it was a very, very good question raised. Um, and so how do we actually train our students to learn about those, those challenges and those dichotomies? Because the, the temptation is going to be to take advantage of them, drive the profit, drive the revenues out, but it, at the cost of jobs. So there's a lot of complex issues underneath that. Michael, one of the things I don't think I heard on any of the three lists that surely would have been on a list when we were all going to school is knowing stuff. Knowing stuff doesn't seem to be uh, a priority of the education system these days. Why not? Well, you could just uh, punch into Google and know what you want in terms of knowledge. But these, the, the kids that we're talking about now in the new, I call it the new pedagogy, because these kids are partners with teachers. They're using technology 24-7, you know, well, part of the learning thing. They learn a lot. And the... Uh, the skills on any test, if these kids are immersed as they are in the schools we're talking about, they do well on any kind of test that we would think is important, including knowledge. Do you think children need to know 
what year the country was founded in and who its first prime minister was? Uh, not necessarily in that way, in that what? sense. Oh. In that sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They need to know something about the, the, the time period, what, what were the issues going on, uh, but the mere fact is not going to give much advantage. I'm going to ask this question again. Okay. Jamil, <laughs> do, you, do you think it's important that Canadian students know what year the country was founded and who its first prime minister was? Yeah, I, I, so I think it, <laughs> so, that, uh, <laughs> that, so that's, the, that's the correct answer. Okay. Yeah. Go <laughs> so I do think it's important for a number of reasons, including like the value of like citizenship and what it means to participate in this country meaningfully. Uh, but in terms of um, it's maybe in, in terms uh, in terms of when we're thinking about how to get people employed, it, it's actually probably more important for them to know how to find the information than to be able to recite the information when asked. And I think that's the distinction um, is is what is the goal we have in mind when we are answering these types of questions right no argument there but Terry is there not a, a basic foundation of knowledge that everybody who wants to call themselves a Canadian citizen including 10 year old children in school need to know never mind need to know how to find but just need to know uh, clearly there's a base level to understand our our history and our and our country and our roots um, but I think the memorization aspect of education really needs to be rethought. So country, the year the country was founded, maybe first prime minister, maybe naming all the prime ministers, naming all the capitals of all the cities or all, of all the uh, provinces, not convinced that that's an essential skill for our, for our future. I think that the bigger part that um, we, we just started talking about is, is the learning, the, the capability, the knowledge of how do you actually learn and adaptability, what, what, what we're learning through the exponentials is this stuff is changing fast and our world is changing fast. So we need to teach people how to actually learn and adapt and grow through that. And that's less about memorization and more about how to do the research, how to actually adapt and learn and, and, the, and how to tap into ecosystems that can help you do that quickly. Those skills, I think, aren't, aren't taught nearly as much as they need to be. I do get that and I get the we need to teach young people how to, how to learn, not just what to learn. But isn't it, I'm going to give you a second kick at this because I found your first answer so shockingly unsatisfying. Uh, and I only say that because I respect you so much and I've interviewed some, you so many times, but is there not a bare bones foundation of knowledge that you've got to know as a student? Not, not that you need to know how to find, but that you have to know to be a contributing citizen of this country in the 21st century. Uh, yes, but it, if you go to the six C's I mentioned and just take citizenship, Citizenship means you have to know what it's to be a Canadian, and what's the, what, are the, what are the values of Canada, what, where did it come from, why is it important, why is it important to know the world. So you, the six C's that I mentioned uh, covered everything. Character education is, is one of the six C's. It's about the perseverance, resilience, the hard work. Uh, if you're immersed in this, in, this, in uh, uh, part of our curriculum, we call it the new one curriculum, steeped in real life problem solving. If you're steeped in real life problem solving day after day, instead of wasting your time on uh, memorization, but actually in there, working with other students, learning from, uh, I mean, you're bound to know a lot. They, you just will know it because you're, you're actually applying it and you're going to be a better citizen and a, be a more knowledgeable citizen if you, uh, if you uh, follow the knowledge, not just how to, I better look it up today because I need to know it today. It's more like, what is it like to be a person these days? And where do we fit in the world? And why is it important to be having certain values? And who else is in the country? All of those things are, are just going to be a natural part of what you will learn and learn faster and learn deeper. Okay. Well, I'm just putting everybody on notice that our first prime minister's 200th birthday is about eight months away. So you're going to be inundated with Sir John A. stuff soon. And you will know this. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot. Uh, Jamil, let me go to you first on this. We've heard a lot about uh, STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. And... I wonder if there is a, a reevaluation of that going on to the extent that it maybe ought to go from STEM to STEAM. Put an A in there and add arts. What do you think? Yeah, uh, most of the argument for um, 
focusing on arts and, and the, tr the transitioning from STEM to STEAM um, is largely based on the idea that there is uh, creative potential that gets tapped into with um, a more of an emphasis on arts education. Um, my, uh, you know, in reading stuff about the issues um, and under trying to understand the the actual contribution of an arts education in our public school system, I think that's true. Uh, there's a lot of similarity, I think, between science and art in terms of the um, processes that it asks students to develop, the creativity it asks students to develop, um, and you, using some of the terminology from earlier today, design thinking um, and aspects like that. So I think it makes a lot of sense, and most important of all, that it appeals to some students that STEM might not reach otherwise. Um, and I think that if you can get similar skills and capabilities developed among among young people um, by adding an arts focus, uh, then I think that alone makes it worth doing. Terry, are we moving from STEM to STEAM? Uh, the arts, I think, is essential. And we're, you know, we're looking at a whole new set of skills. So we're hiring people, for example, that have visual arts degrees, going to places like OCAD to get them, because we're, we're learning that just having the technical skills, so the math skills or the engineering skills or the finance skills, is often not enough to communicate and whether we communicate visually. So we're doing things like, um, you know, in our, in our greenhouse where we do innovation labs and so on, we actually bring people in and we have um, artists who capture the entire agenda. And I think, Ken, the board had some of that when they went through this. Um, so how do we actually light up both sides of your brain, you know, the technical side as well as the artistic side? And the, the neuroscience behind this is if you actually tap into the arts, you actually have better retention and better memory, which is why visuals are more memorable than just a bunch of text slides. So focusing on the arts, both on the visual side as well as the communication capabilities is very important from our perspective. Michael, do you want to add to that insofar as we know how important STEM is? If you add the A, what does that also give you? Well, I, I think Terry said it best, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll say it this way, the road to hell is paved with false dichotomies. <laughs> and, uh, and so what we're seeing in, in that presentation this morning there's a lot of the design and element and visual and other things that bring this to life. It, it's better for math, it's better for uh, every subject area. So I think we are now seeing in this new uh, work the, a much more integrated curriculum before your very eyes. And it, it is more STEAM than, than STEM. It's happening. Yeah, it is happening. You, you know the education system in Ontario obviously extremely well, been studying it for decades and decades, and we're, we're um, Dalt McGinty's chief um, education czar, if you like, one of his top advisors. And I wonder, as you look at it, does, does the system react swiftly and nimbly enough to the new needs as they are identified at the dawn of this century? Uh, I would say, by and large, no. It doesn't act, uh, react swiftly enough. But in, our, in the new work that I'm describing, it's happening very quickly. And I think the reason is the push and pull. The push I mentioned, students are bored. I, we used to say students uh, can't wait. Now I want to say students won't wait. So the students are really bored. That's a push. And uh, one of the schools we filmed, the principal said, well, teachers were bored too, but they didn't know it until they got uh, So there's a real uh, need for life in, in traditional schooling. And, and then the rapidity of this, because I want to emphasize the rapidity. What's happening now is new directional vision, very rapid letting go and in innovation and, re and uh, learning, and then reining in and consolidating and keep that kind of uh, learning cycle going. And we've seen that rapidity happen in the schools na almost naturally once they have the chance to do it. So I'm optimistic now. I think it's been slow, slow, slow for, let's say, the last uh, 40 years. But the rapidity now of the change that we're talking about can be enormously uh, uh, acceler accelerated and will because we already see it happening spontaneously. What do you see, Jamil? Um, yeah, I, I guess one of the things that um, structurally I think is really important to recognize is that we have an education system that still I think puts a lot of students in boxes that you are streamed often uh, into like a, a college or an applied. Uh, track versus a university or an academic track and I think when we talk about innovation and all these new ways that we want students to engage and all the different opportunities that are being created by them and in some ways recognize the inherent value that different students will bring based on their their experiences um, and their talents we are still um, in some ways limiting a lot of the young people that we have in our public school system and I think that's 
to me, a, a really, really serious concern that we should all think a lot about. Um, and the, the trend of having university graduates go to college, I think, reflects that, that we are still um, treating young people in a way that their post-secondary options don't reflect. So, Jerry, I have to tell you, we, we've done numerous programs on this over the years on TVO, obviously. And one of the things, one of the criticisms we frequently have heard, we've heard it on programs that you've participated in as well, Michael, is that we have a wonderfully designed education system for an agrarian 19th century society, which we aren't anymore. Do you see too much evidence of that still? So it was brought home uh, very clearly to me on a personal basis. So my son, I said, was uh, 19. So he's in second year digital media. I won't name the school. But so uh, came home after first year and said, you know, it was a great year, you know, went Went uh, through the program, had had a nice blend of sciences and, and arts. So Is that community good. college? No. Okay. Um, but and I'm not going to narrow it down. Sounds like. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but but he said, you know, it's really frustrating, Dad. We've got you know hands-on piece of our curriculum where we actually use some digital media tools. I said, well, what's frustrating about that? You're a very hands-on kid. You like gamification. You like like doing different things. And and he said, well, we're using tools that nobody in in the actual corporate world is using now. And so I'm I'm being trained in technology that that is not going to be something that's I'm going to be able to actually use when I get a job. And I said, well, that's not good. Let's uh, and it's digital media. This is a digital. So this isn't a program that's been running for 20 years, right? Like it's digital media. So I said, okay, let's let's. Um, why don't we go and talk to them about it? He said, Dad, I already talked to them. This is my son who, like, we couldn't get him to talk to a teacher or anybody when he was in high school. But, but he, he took the initiative with a friend, and they went and talked to the dean at the school. And they said, you know, here's the problem. We don't, this particular code is, is very old. The software program is very old, and it's not going to be something that any of the companies that we're going to work for is going to be. And the dean said, yep, yeah, that's right. He said, but we had the program certified two years ago, and we have to use the curriculum that we have in digital media, which is changing every month, let alone six months or two years. So we have to wait till we've done our four year run before we can change that part of the curriculum was the perception and, and to some extent Come on, the you gotta tell us what school this is. Come on, come on. So, but what I would tell you is that is actually pervasive. So there are schools that are adapting, but we need to figure out the and. So we need to figure out how do we create predictable quality um, you know, quality courses that can be certified and, and we can have the right kind of credentializing, but something that is also adaptable and nimble in the world that I just talked about where the software programs used last year, you know, are, are no longer relevant in many instances. And certainly if you look at a four-year four -year degree. So he, with the, with the teachers and the principal, have figured out a bolt-on that they're getting access to some other software and technology, but they are working around the education system, not inside and with it in that instance. So that that I think just brought it to life in something that should be very fast, very nimble, but instead was, you know, locked in, structured, okay, here we go, just go down that path. Michael, how does that make any sense at all? Uh, it doesn't, and I, I think there uh, there is a solution, and uh, in um, this uh, student success program, the high school reform program, and many of you know our high school graduation rate has gone from 68% to 83%. There's a, a, a program called High Skills Major, and basically it's a thematic program in high school that students, many students would have dropped out actually gravitate towards. They're on different themes, and they all involve partnership with, uh, with the cutting edge, whatever the, the, the domain is, with cutting edge business. It's part of the educational relationship. The model is there. It's gone from 600 kids in the first to, I don't know, 20,000 20, more than that right now. So, uh, there actually is a model, and a school has to be innovative and partnered with where the, where the uh, innovation is. And you can do it. You can build it in. There's nothing preventing that from happening. Well, except that, I mean, unless I've missed something yeah. here, I think when the Liberals took over in 2003, we were spending, whatever it was, 15, 16 billion dollars on education, and now we're well over 20. I mean, we're right. spending billions and billions more 10 years later on education, and yet we still hear stories like this. I mean, that, that can't be acceptable, is it? We were doing K to 12, right? You're talking about after after grade 12. So okay. I, uh, no, that's not acceptable. What do we do about it, George? What do we do? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Deputy uh, Minister of Education yeah, okay. George Zagarek is here.
Does anybody have any idea what it's going to take to make that adaptation? Shamil, you want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it's really, really important to create um, opportunities for students to kind of reinvent themselves and their goals as they go along through the process. And what I mean by that is that I'm going to go back to this uh, uh, tracking thing because I was tracked as an applied and college level student and in some ways I think the system worked in a way that um, silenced me and, and um, have since been able to work my way out of that but I think that it's really important to make sure that young people feel that they as they go through these processes are not um, being told that uh, their opinions or where they spend their time and their experiences matter less um, because they don't perform well at a certain period in their life for a variety of reasons and I think that that's one of the things in terms of um, making sure that it's um, a broader base of people giving input into that adaptability and making sure that there are people that it's not just about building systems to plug people in, but also making sure that because you didn't perform well at a certain age in your life means that you cannot also create those systems um, is, is also important. So that's something that I would really emphasize, which is that a lot of the students who might be dropping out of high school or might be performing very low in high school are also students that um, I think are deserving of some uh, leadership opportunity to, to shape the process. And I think those are also students that we often don't assume have something to contribute to those conversations. Can I follow up a bit on this? Yeah. What, uh, at, at what stage of your educational life did you start to see yourself being tracked into the way you were? Um, honestly, I, did, I wasn't really self-aware until after I had finished uh, and kind of graduated, uh, was working as a dishwasher at a restaurant and then went to Humber College and, and it was in post-secondary school that my life started to change. And I was um, on the uh, Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society's uh, Youth Awards Selection Committee this year and I saw a lot of applications of young people who went through far more challenging circumstances than I did, but also had a similar experience where you could see that that moment where they finished high school was transformative in their life, that all of a sudden they were being treated like an adult and had the expectations of adult that their life circumstances had put on them already, but the school system did not treat them um, with that level of maturity um, and adulthood. And, and I think that's a really important period in people's lives where they can often redefine themselves and in some ways surprise themselves as what they're capable of. But um, we, if you only define them by what they did before they were 18, um, then you wind up limiting their voices and their ability to shape these processes. How old were you, though, when you, when you think you started to get tracked? Oh, oh. I guess as soon as I started high school, 14. I mean, as soon as I demonstrated a, a rebellious spirit and, uh, you know, was, was maybe not participating the way I ideally was supposed to, I can look back and see there were several moments where, you know, my mother was called into the principal's office and she was being in some ways conditioned to believe that her expectations of me needed to fall, get lower uh, than they were. And why do you think it happened? I think it's a few things, like one, that I was in a school system that didn't really understand me or my life circumstances and the kinds of things that were occupying most of my emotional and mental energy as a teenager were irrelevant to the classroom. Like. Uh, you know, I, those were not the challenges that I was dealing with on the day to day were not things I was being prepared for at school. And so it felt like two very distinct parts of my life. And um, as soon as I kind of recognized that and stopped getting any self affirmation and self worth from my, you know, days in school, and, and then I, I could see myself pulling away. And when I pulled away, the I was kind of let go. So Michael, what's, I'm gonna, ironic, what's ironic, Steve, is is Jamil should have been tracked as the entrepreneurial track. Sure. Right at that point of the rebellious spirit when he was breaking out, challenging the norms. Those are exactly the capabilities that we need in our entrepreneurs. Right. Is our school system uh, aware enough of this to make that determination, Michael? Uh, I think the well, this event today is uh, significant because of the timeliness of it. That is to say, we're talking about the way it. Uh, it, what we've inherited, and it, we know how, how wrong it is. I want to say again that there is a revolution underway right now, and it can happen rapidly, and it's because kids and teachers who were mutually bored are actually doing th something differently. So I think that these problems are, are there, but we, have, we actually have the strategies, and we have the, if you focus on them, you can, you can start to make progress very, very rapidly. And the very fact that we're talking like this today, we're not talking today like uh, we, what we should do in 10 years from now. We're talking about this is happening right now everywhere. You saw it this morning in the talk that Terry gave. 
and it's so uh, so in your face right now uh, that that the action I think is 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 going is is happening, and we will see much more change in the next three years than we saw in the last 13, 15 years. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something a little uncomfortable here and hit this on the head a little harder. And I don't know if this was your circumstance, uh, Jamil, but again, from the programs we've done. Is this not still a school system that if you're Aboriginal or Portuguese or black mm. tends to stream you into whatever, technical as opposed to academic or not entrepreneurial, if you want to use Terry's language, more than it should? Uh, probably more than it should, but less than it did. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's changing. We have the focus on, uh, uh, we've closed the gap on a lot of, a lot of uh, categories. And this is, uh, this, is, this is the point. This is about uh, Im improving for each and every uh, student and what are the particulars that would have to happen. Uh, Jamal would not have, if coming through now, would be recognized earlier and could have an entrepreneurial stream in this high skills majors that never would have existed before. So this, this, it's, it's a sense of urgency and it's, it has to happen. But I, I, I think that is the point. Focus on it and do it. I think you were, as I look around the room, I think you were in high school more recently than most of the rest of us in this yeah. room. So maybe just draw upon your own experiences. Did you get a sense when you were in high school that you were being taught how to innovate? Yeah, so I graduated from high school in 2005. Um, Anybody I, else got that beat here? Anybody <laughs> graduate more recently than 2005? I didn't think so. Okay. No, so there, you. There, yeah, we have yeah. some actual current high school students yes, here. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, but no, I don't think I was being taught to innovate. I mean, even just simple things of like suggesting. I, I, I remember, um, so part of the reason why I did really well um, in post-secondary school in contrast to high school was that I was able to write about the things that I thought about and that I cared about. Um, and I, there were numerous moments where trying to bring those subjects into the high school classroom where I was, they were d dismissed completely. And I think that a big part of innovation is having a system that receives new ideas as they come, that is dynamic um, throughout a semester and that encourages people to bring um, bring in subject matter and ideas that wouldn't otherwise be there. So I think it was the opposite of innovation, quite frankly. I felt very much that it was um, being asked to fit into a box, and if you didn't fit into that box, then you just kind of felt less um, less engaged. Um, and I think p our post-secondary system, based on my experience, is a wonderful job of shifting away from that, in that I felt, you know, with the ability to pick courses, the ability to select a major, but also that professors that I had was blessed to have were a lot more open to receiving receiving that kind of um, feedback on the day-to-day. -day. But I, I, I didn't feel that was the case at all in high school. So, Terry, I, th I think I've heard Roger Martin say that we ought to teach innovation in school in the same way we teach history and geography and math and science and art and everything else. Can we do that? Um, there's a bit of a myth that innovation is just this magic thing that happens and if just everybody could be like Steve Jobs it would just go there. There is, there is actually a science to innovation and working, working through it. Now you can't mandate innovation, um, but, but when you break down its fundamental components it's about creativity, it's about entrepreneurial spirit, it's about integrated thinking, so bringing multiple disciplines to the table. And, and critical strategy and choices. So all of those disciplines can be embedded. I don't think they're really be embedded, being embedded to the level that, that we would like to see them. So we still tend to do things in the, the curriculum of math or the curriculum of geography or history, which we need to make sure that we remember our, here, here. our forefathers, et cetera. Um, and mothers. But, and mothers, yes. And so you know, balancing that with how do we bring all of these disciplines together, I think is one of the key parts. And, that, and that's a piece of innovation. Most innovations, if you look at them, it's not one big aha moment. It's, it's a collision of many things over time. And that's where we need to have people that understand how do I bring a variety of disciplines together and challenge. The, the other piece that we, we stop doing as we go through the journey, probably after about grade four or five, is allowing kids to fail. Like try, try stuff and, and a lot of stuff doesn't work. The, the greatest entrepreneurs in the world failed many, many times. We, we don't and yet do we that teach them not to. Yeah. We teach them not to. Now it's not like we're gonna build companies on failure, but like that's not how our, our system works. But at the same time, we have to try things and, and experiment and somehow we've lost that, 
that part of our educational system, I think, and we're trying to build it back in. But Let me just pick up on that, Michael, because we, we seem to have a value in Canada that failure is a horrible thing and should be avoided at all costs, unlike in many other cultures. I know I was in Israel a few years ago, and they say failure is essential. You know, you, the, the startup nation says if you're not failing, you're not trying. Do we need to change our attitude around that? Uh, I, think, I think it is very different in the, uh, the new schools that are working on, uh, on the partnership with students. The whole notion of, of failing and learning and legitimizing that, and including with teachers. You, have to, you can't say to teachers, if you make a mistake, there's going to be a huge problem. You have to, you have, to have schools where teachers are willing to take those risks as well and be, and be part of that uh, improvement cycle. So I think it is happening, and I, I don't think we're preoccupied by failure. Okay. Let me, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'd like to get this audience involved as well with your questions. Uh, let me put this out here, because things have changed a lot, again, from the time that we all went to school uh, a while ago. In the last five years in Ontario, we have seen a 40% increase in university graduates going to college. And apparently the numbers suggest, I've been told, university grads have only a 0.7% better employment rate than college grads. What do you think this suggests? Go ahead. You want to go first, Jamil? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I think when I was uh, a teenager, there was a bit of a, a myth that college was colleges were inherently an inferior post-secondary institution and there was some stigma attached to it and um, so having gone to Humber College before, before I did my um, university education there was an aspect of that in the back of my head where I often thought like oh because I went to college first maybe people will perceive me differently I remember even when I was applying putting in law school applications that I thought that might be a negative against me and I think in my generation, I'm seeing that change to where a lot of the people I graduated from York University with went on to go to Humber College for different programs to get more employable training. So there is a shift that's happening. I think that stigma is going away, that people are recognizing that colleges have something important to offer um, people who've already gotten a liberal arts education or some other education. Um, and then also just with things like nursing and being, and being an electrician and all these professions that we're starting to see have real advantages in terms of the aggregate amount of money you might make in a lifetime. That um, and contrasting that to the fact that being a, having a BA doesn't really guarantee much employment um, these days, uh, depending on what you study. So I do think there's a huge shift, and I think it's something that we should be really, really aware of and 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 celebrate and make sure that we are passing that message on to high school students because I still think that it's. In university is where that transformation is happening, but when I talk to, to high school students, there's still more stigma than there should be, and that is going away as they get older. But I think that we still need to get rid of that a little bit more in the in the you know secondary school culture. How many years did you go to Humber? I just was there for one, and then I transferred. And then you transferred yeah. to where? York. For how many years there? Four. And you graduated with? Uh, BA in uh, nonprofit management and international development. Would you say that was essential, that degree, to what you're doing right now? It was essential to me knowing I needed to go to law school <laughs> if I wanted a, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of employment options that I was looking for. So, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I left the, the BA. I, when I was the first, second year at York, I kind of looked at the people who were graduating, and a lot of them were not finding work in the field that we were studying, so I knew I had to do more education after that. Was the year at Humber a waste? No, that year changed my life completely. That's where I learned how to read and write effectively and with a purpose. So, yeah. Good. Terry, on this issue of, of the back and forth between colleges and universities now, what does this pretend? Well, I think, that, I mean, the stats can be deceiving, right? So we need to unpack it a little bit and say, so what's, what's really going on there? And I'm not an expert in, in that space at all. But again, if I draw from some personal experience, so son wanted to do digital media. What he really wanted to do was design games, right? So, you know, decent high school grades, not spectacular. Decent high school grades said, okay, best place in the world, in the world, to go do that, Sheridan College. Sheridan College, bar none, Sheridan College. 
he could not get into Sheridan College to do game design if he had not come explicitly from an arts high school. So we get, we start packaging people very early, right? If he'd not gone to an arts high school, couldn't couldn't go there, right? So went to another university to go get a degree. He will likely, either after third year or finish his university degree, he will likely hopefully go to Sheridan to do that. So so that's a designed path as He's, opposed to I finished university and then said okay now you know I can't get a job and maybe that's that's a designed path to build up his capabilities um, and we're actually very you know apart from you know the educational costs along the journey we're very excited about that and I think he'll build a bunch of fundamentals as well as going and getting the practical skills at the best school in the world for that kind of capability right so that's a very different ends of the continuum in terms of that journey, I think, and he'll start at DreamWorks in what year? Yeah, exactly. Well, ho hopefully while he's uh, while he's still in university, but uh, we'll see. Gotcha. We'll see on that. Michael, your view on this phenomenon? Uh, yeah, I think the uh, the whole emphasis on uh, the, that's now on doing that. Let's say the innovation, the design, the hands-on doing has become uh, more respected intellectually, where it wasn't before. It was segmented, and so now we have. Uh, in order to be effective in life, whether it's business or social justice, you have to be an entrepreneur. You have to know how to mobilize people, solve problems, uh, motivate uh, people, innovate, design. So I think that's why the lines are being blurred. And what, what is, uh, what's happened prior to that is uh, community colleges had the, uh, the negative uh, value and universities had the upper hand, but it was only, it, it wasn't a distinction that really could hold very long and should not hold very long. And now we see the crossover where you see uh, community colleges elevating because of the hands-on effectiveness and entrepreneurialism they're able to capture more readily than universities have in the past. Uh, just before I throw it back to you, I know all of you want to join me in thanking these three for a really good discussion here this morning. Thanks,